Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, family. I'm Vic, great covered alcoholic. Happy to be here with you guys today. So... For reference for any newcomers, my sobriety date is February 10th, 2019. And step three was a very, uh, it was a very interesting experience for me. I thought I was going to have a lot of resistance around my fourth step. Um, and I had a tremendous amount of resistance come up when I got to, to three, you know, really briefly, just as a qualification, um, I started drinking when I was 14 or 15. I drank until I was 28. I didn't grow up with alcoholic parents, but there was a lot of dysfunction. There was a lot of separation. There was a lot of me not knowing how to share a place in the world with people. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to be in relationships with people. I didn't know anything about vulnerability or intimacy in relationships. I didn't understand how to let people get to know who I was. I didn't know how to share myself. I didn't know how to hold conversations. It was a lot of me attempting to be who I thought the people around me needed me to be. Um, I was very much the chameleon where I would just adjust to the people that I was around. I would adjust to the people that I was in front of. I had a very low tolerance for any sort of big emotions. And I never really learned like an emotional Rolodex. Um, So when I started drinking, That gave me a lot of groundedness. I also want to say if somebody wants to start the timer. So one of the things that I realized was, um, you know, when drinking was that this gave me this like really altered experience, which was the experience I was always looking for in all these other ways. And I never had an opportunity to feel like the playing field was leveled. I never feel like felt like I had an opportunity to be myself um because I really had no idea who I was and when I started drinking I was an alcoholic drinker from the very beginning I had no concept of control I had no concept of I had no concept of control I had no concept of how much I was taking in let alone the ability to control it you know through my teenage years I wanted to stop and I couldn't I did geographical changes I got into relationships as ways of attempting to control my my drinking, because the one thing that would uh, have like the slightest chance, like the slightest human power that could control my drinking was codependency, um, because I would just as easily become addicted to another person as I was with alcohol. Um, When I finally stopped drinking, or when I came to the point that I that I found my way to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, my best friend had passed away, she was a member of this fellowship, she wanted to cherry pick at her fifth step and it cost her her life. Um, so I understand what they mean when they say that it's a life or death errand. And I, I I got in touch with the woman who was sponsoring her at the time. And that woman came in and she didn't just work with me. She worked with my family. She was in touch with my mother. She was, she was helping me through teaching my mother to set boundaries with me because I was just an emotional terrorist. And she taught me, she, she taught my mother how to not enable, um, my drinking she you know she taught my mother that my mother didn't have to love me to death and that was one of the most helpful things that she could have done because so much of my drinking and so much of my behavior around my drinking just took place under my mother's roof um you know so my mom really just dealt with the catastrophe that was me um by the time I stopped drinking I was a 24 hour a day drinker there was absolutely nothing else that I would do with my time I would wake up I would drink I would make sure that I secured more alcohol. I drank until I passed out. I would wake up and do it again. Um, I just wanted to be anesthetized and dissociated. I wanted my memory wiped. I wanted to be hallucinating. If I could, I wanted to be unconscious. Um, so when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I had a had a sponsor that just made it very clear to me. You know, she she made it clear to me that I had already had my first step experience before I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous. My job in step one here was just that I was able to admit that. Um, but I was able to admit it and then understand that the unmanageability of my life had nothing to do with how punctual I was or how neat I was or how tidy I was. It had nothing to do 
with me being able to be responsible. And it had everything to do with my ability to manage my thoughts and my feelings. Um, it had to do with my ability to manage the way that I was in relationship with the world um, and with other people, with myself, with my finances. You know, she made it really clear to me that the first step, the first half of the first step is the only part of the 12 steps that even has anything to do with alcohol. Everything other than that is either about relationship with myself, relationship with other people, or relationship with God. Um, my second step was just this real resistance to thinking that I was insane, even though I knew that I was that, that I was powerless over drinking. Um, you know, my, my sponsor told me, she said, you know, when you remove alcohol is when you're actually going to see what it is that you're up against. And when I stopped drinking and I started still getting the thoughts and I start getting the, the, the voice in my head that was telling me where to go, what to do, what was going to happen, how I was going to drink, how it was going to happen and how I had no say in it. Um, that was when I really started to understand like the magnitude of this, this illness, this, this experience um, of seeking ease and comfort, essentially seeking safety because alcohol was the most consistent and reliable thing that I thought I had in my life. So when I got to my third step, I sat on my sponsor's couch at about 90 days sober. And I cried because all I wanted to do was go drink. And she looked at me and she said, all right, you want to go drink, go drink. And I was like, what do you mean? You're, you're supposed to be helping me not drink. Why are you going to, why are you going to tell me to go drink? She's like, you've been whining and crying for two weeks about how you want to go drink. She's like, so go drink. You know, she made it really clear. She said, no reservations, any lurking notions. She said, if you still want to go drink. She's like, that's a reservation. She, right. And it says that the wording is quite optional of this third step. You know, the wording is quite optional as long as it's voiced with no reservation. She's like, so my job is to take you through these steps. And according to these steps, it's telling me right there that if you have a reservation, that the rest of this isn't going to work. So as long as you have a reservation, there's no point in going through a third step because whatever you say just isn't real. So if you need to go drink, go drink. So, you know, my spite obviously was like, <clears throat> I'm not going to go drink because you told me I'm going to drink. I will not do that. Um, so I was just in a lot of resistance around it. You know, I had a friend who told me like, you know, why don't you pray for the thoughts to go away? And I told her, I was like, no, nah. I was like, I'm actually praying that they don't go away because all I wanted to do, like, I, like, I like, and this was the thing for me, right? Like I've come to a lot of peace around my alcoholism. Um, and there's no part of me that can ever say that like, I didn't absolutely love the experience of being an alcoholic because I woke up every single day committed to those actions. I woke up every single day committed to those behaviors. Um, I woke up every single day and it was the thing that, that gave me an immense amount of peace. And what I realized was it was just an attempt for me to feel safe in the world. Um, and with that, there was nothing wrong with me. It was just a choice if that was how I wanted to live my life, right? This was my third step decision. It was about me choosing to play God. You know, there's, um, when I got to the part above the third step promises with my sponsor, you know, she said, when you sincerely take such a position and she would always say to me, she's like, it's not about the position of getting on your knees and praying. She said, it was the position where you realize that your position of playing God didn't work. Right. And when I was kind of moving closer and closer to this third step experience, I had this really beautiful experience and in a nutshell, um, I was with another member of AA one day I was in a parking lot and I found a wallet and I looked inside the wallet to try to return it to the owner. And there was a picture of a little girl and a letter attached. It was like a fake designer wallet. There was like some library cards and some gift cards. So I'm like, all right, this is like a kid's wallet. And I, when I opened up the picture in the letter and in the letter, this little girl had written talking about how, she didn't know if she wanted to be alive and nobody understood her. She was afraid to tell people. She wanted to know if she was ever going to be happy again, um, that she was depressed. She lost interest in all of her hobbies um, and that she felt like this world would just be better off without her. And I read this letter from this probably 11 or 12 year old. And, and I just read and I just saw myself, you know, I saw myself. I saw myself when I was 11 and 12 and I saw myself when I was 28 there. I still identified with that. And I was able to find the owner of the wallet through the library card and I returned it. And um, I got to speak to the girl's mother. And I said, you know, I read this letter in her wallet. It was really a little bit disturbing. And, you know, I just want to know if she's doing okay. And the mother said, you know, it's been rough, she said, but, you know, we're working at it every day. And I said, well, I left my name and my number on a post-it note and I put it inside of the wallet. I said, this might seem weird. I'm a stranger, but 
Um, you know, I had that same experience as a kid and as a teenager and as an adult. Um, you know, but I I don't I don't know that I feel that way anymore. I said if she ever needs someone to talk to who gets it, I'll be there. Um, so my third step decision was when I realized that there was absolutely nothing in Alcoholics Anonymous that was about me. It was none of my business. My sobriety was none of my business. The idea that me getting sober was about me was completely incorrect. Um, I had already sp spent my whole life wrapped up, worried about me. Um, and my, my decision was that if this little girl called, I wanted to be useful. And I knew that if I didn't make this third step decision, there might be a day that she called and I could not help her if I was ossified. Um, I could not help her if I was loaded. There was nothing that I could do to help. Um, and I realized, I was like, oh, I was like, if it's about me, like, I'm never going to do this. Like, I'm never actually going to do this, right? I'm never going to actually show up and do these steps. I'm never actually going to mean it um, because I'm quite content. My, my comfort zone, not because it's comfortable, but because it's familiar, um, is alcoholism. Like, that is what is comfortable and familiar to me. Um, so it had to be about something outside of me that I was willing to do for me because it wasn't about me. And it was one of the many paradoxes that I've come to really understand in working these steps in this program. You know, there's this, this saying that, you know, prayer is not meant to influence God. It's me meant to change the nature of the one who prays, right? So asking God to come in and, and direct my thoughts and my actions to take over this concept of my will in my life and my third step um, it wasn't about me trying to make God do something. It was about, about, it was, how do I make myself um, come to this place of surrender? And I heard this really beautiful thing last night. Um, my, my fiance was listening to a podcast and this gentleman said, he said, you know, surrender and taking the position of praying on your knees is not because you're, you're, you're just kneeling down to ask God for something. It's when you've actually done the work and you've put in all the action that you can and that you are so exhausted that you are brought to your knees and then you're able to ask God for help. And that was something I didn't understand at that time with the third step. You know, one of my really good friends, um, she was speaking at a beginner's meeting and she was speaking on steps one, two, and three one day. And right, like our, our third step says, made a decision to turn our, our, Made, made this decision to turn ourselves over to the care of God as we understood him, right? And the 11th step tells me about God as I understand him. So somewhere between three and 11, my vision of God, my understanding of God is going to change. But there was something that she pointed out in there that was just earth shattering for me at the time. And she said, to the care of God, right? And she said, you know, you use that word probably all the time, you know, whether you're saying that you do or do not care about something. She said, but I, she said, I doubt if you really understand the weight that that word carries and she read the definition of it, that the word care means it's the provision of what's necessary for the health, welfare, maintenance, and protection of someone or something that their serious attention or consideration applied to doing something correctly or to avoid damage or risk. And that was the complete opposite of what I was able to do for myself in alcoholism. I could not provide what was necessary by any means other than alcohol. There was absolutely uh, no care for my health. There was no welfare. There was no maintenance. There was no protection. Um, I gave serious attention to nothing other than my alcoholism. And I could not consider or apply the way that I did things um, to do it correctly or to avoid damage or risk. I was basically just a walking, talking um, hazard at all times. You know, so, so this idea that God is going to come in and do these things for me, Right. For me, in that understanding was like, I have exhausted all options to myself that I actually fall to my knees in asking that this be something that is done for me. And, you know, the thing for me with my third step and turning that over is like, when I say like, what is it that I've really exhausted? And for me, it's about that I've exhausted my self-righteousness, um, that I've exhausted my righteous indignation that I've exhausted the idea that I know better. Um, you know, I would say that it's about exhausting my ego, but you cannot kill your ego. It's impossible. It's literally just there to protect you. Um, there's nothing wrong with your ego. It's just about how I develop my ego, right? So it was like, had I exhausted all of these means of self-preservation that were essentially causing me more harm, right? And I was only trying to preserve what I knew and preserve what was familiar because I grew up in a lot of dysfunction. So what I knew was dysfunction right? The, the thing for me about my third step and the direction of my thoughts and my actions, it was that the idea of being at peace and the, the idea of having serenity 
Um, that was what was fearful for me. It wasn't about going back to alcoholism. I'm very comfortable there. I'm very comfortable in that place. Um, it was about familiarizing myself with the idea that being at peace was safe. And what, what I realized was in that experience, um, I was bored. I was bored because my body, my nervous system, everything was just used to chaos. It was used to constantly being in a state of arousal, um, you know, where I couldn't tell the difference between feeling alive or feeling angry. You know, it was something that made me feel something. So that numbness that came on the other side of sobriety and allowing myself to really thaw out to to feel myself, feel my feelings. It was about transitioning out of survival. You know, my third step was like, can God give me enough care, protection and safety that I don't need to live in survival anymore? Um, and that was terrifying because that was how my entire life had operated because of what was happening to me emotionally and in my mind due to that unmanageability. You know, you cannot manage anything in survival. You can only stay alive. And the only way I knew how to stay alive was to drink. Um, you know, I've heard when people say, you know, like I wake up every morning and I turn it over to God, like I made my third step. I don't wake up and turn it over every day because I have no need to take it back anymore. Um, like I'm not an alcoholic who wakes up. I don't wake up as an alcoholic. I don't wake up restless, irritable, and discontent. I wake up happy, joyous, and free because that was what I was told I was going to experience. Um, you know, I don't experience a life that gives me pain. I, I see a life that gives me opportunities and I see a God that gives me an opportunity to, to direct me and guide me and how I'm going to navigate that. You know, I don't subscribe to a life where I need things to be hard. And when I need to suffer, you know, these, these is, you know, it's what Carl Jung talked about those huge emotional displacements and rearrangements, right. Moving out a set of conceptions that were once the driving force of my life and replacing them with a set of new ones. You know, there's, there's this whole portion of me as a human being um, is right. It's about my decision. Um, and something that I found is that if you were to ask me, what's all my pain, what's all my suffering, what's all my problems, what's all my insecurities, what's all my fears, right? I could tell you all of that and I could cry my eyes out and I could feel those feelings so deeply. And you could also ask me all the wonderful things about myself and the good things about myself. And I could tell you that, and I could feel those things so deeply. And what that tells me is that I have the ability to feel within duality. I have the ability to feel within polarity. And if I could feel all my sadness and all my pain, but I can also feel all my joy and all my happiness and all my gratitude, which one is real? So what do I decide to wake up every day and subscribe to? Because if one's real and the other's not, right? Like, which one do I choose if I can feel them both? So part of it is that I've given this decision where I allow God to give me the opportunity to experience the full spectrum of the human experience. And if I want to wake up every day and subscribe to the idea that I'm in pain and I wake up a sick and suffering alcoholic, I'm going to wake up a sick and suffering alcoholic. And then I need to have an umbilical cord constantly attached to something outside of myself that's going to save me. Or I can wake up happy, joyous, and free where I'm in conscious and constant contact with a power greater than myself. Um, and this book and these steps and this work has taught me over and over again that it is something deep down within me. It's an unsuspected inner resource, right? That in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. Um, you know, all that searching for, for happiness or searching for something to be um, the panacea, right? Like the great cure-all for everything. It was never something separate from myself. You know, the way that I got sober was working, it was sitting with another woman and a book and myself. That was how I got sober. It was about me, the woman in the book. There was never something else that I needed. That woman explained the book and the book explained me. And I was able to find God in that process. Um, you know, it was a decision to no longer need to overcomplicate my life just to create the chaos that made me feel alive, right? Like, I don't need that anymore. And I actually have a level of, um, I have a level of peace that for some people can sometimes feel looks like complacency. And it's that I'm really good and I'm really content and I'm really happy and I'm really satisfied with my life the way it is. And I don't need to stir things up or necessarily always be in some sort of a action where I find myself meddling in other people's things because my life is so calm and my life gets to be so beautiful that I need to like stir up drama in other places um, or I need to swoop in to save other people or I need to be there to solve their problems, right? You know, it's not my business how God makes me useful. It's just my job to be available and to be a clear channel that has the ability to hear it and the ability to listen. Um, you know, I cleared that out in four and five. I was entirely willing for God to put me in that position in six. And, you know, in seven, it's like, can I allow God to continue to teach me through my experience, through my life, through other humans, 
without thinking that I've come to know everything, you know, how willing am I to bring God into my life and into my, into my everyday circumstances? Will I bring God into my finances? Will I bring God into my business? Will I bring God into my partnership with my, with my fiance? Um, you know, I can't pick and choose where God is and ex expect to have this happy, joyous and free life. And if I'm only experiencing that in certain places in my life, I know very clearly where I haven't made a decision to fully allow God to be a part of that. You know, the decision for me was not about taking me out. It was about bringing God in. And there was this really big understanding for me where, you know, it was also understanding that like, you know, I would hear people say, you know, alcohol wasn't the problem. I was the problem. Um, for me, that just made me feel like, I don't know how that's supposed to help me eliminate shame if I'm just identifying with the idea that I'm the problem, right? It talks about, please relieve me from the bondage of self, right? It doesn't say, please relieve me from my bondage. So there was a me and there was a self. And it was the identification with self. And it was the identification with the idea of who I thought I was, right? When I look at the big book and, and you go through it and you see what is the most used word in the big book, the word self comes up 169 times. Self-propulsion, self-justification, self-will, selfishness, self-seeking, right? There, there was all of this repetition of this idea of self, right? And then right before the third step, it says, there is no getting rid of self without God's help. So for me, the biggest understanding and the biggest freedom was that was that I was making a decision that God was going to show me who I was, rather than me needing to be so convinced about my own identity, because my identity needed chaos. My identity wanted to make me feel bad for everything, right? Self-deprecation, right? I needed to move myself out of the way, but I couldn't do that because I didn't know how to separate that piece. I didn't know how to separate me from self, right? And then the 10-step promises where it says, you know, we are safe and protected. That was the only thing I ever wanted to feel. But it also says in there that the problem has been removed with little thought or effort on our parts. I was never the problem. If I was the problem, then the problem wouldn't be removed because I'm still here. And that was really important for me to understand, to start to alleviate a lot of the shame that I was carrying as an alcoholic. And that was me understanding that I cannot be so convinced about who I think I am. Because the second I think I know who I am, then the second I don't need God. And self would constantly tell me the story of who I thought I was, right? So relieving me from the bondage of self was saying that I was allowing God to remove the idea of who I thought I was so I could see who God really put me in a position to be. And in that experience, what I've ex really realized is that like God has created me as being completely limitless, like limitless, not in the sense of ego, but limitless in the sense of like, there's really nothing that I'm not able to do with God's help right? If it feels like it's something that's too big for me, it's supposed to feel too big for me because God is either going to carry me, mold me, or prepare me to be the person who can handle it. And that has been consistently proven to me over and over and over again. You know, I don't argue with people today. I do not raise my voice. I don't argue with my partner. I don't get angry. I don't get upset. I don't take things personally. It's literally not my business what other people have to think about me. I don't, I don't have a need for there to be things being hard I don't feel the need to sit and, and wallow in my pain and my feelings. I can, I can feel my feelings. Feelings exist in your body chemically for 90 seconds. If it's more than 90 seconds, I understand I'm making a decision to sit in that. So I just, I allow myself to move. It's been constantly about giving myself permission, giving myself consent and allowing myself to experience the, the, the freedom that I was promised. Um, you know, I, I decided that, you know, what I wanted to experience in life, it wasn't working for other people. I wanted to start a business. And I said, God, this feels too big. And God said, all right, well, we're going to do it together. You know, I remember that he is the employer, right? Like God is the employer and I'm showing up and I'm just bringing what God does through me into that space, right? So the same principles that I practice here in all of my affairs are the same principles that I built a business off of, right? I don't bring the 12 steps into what I do with other people within my business, but it's at the, at the root of it. The one thing I talk about constantly is about integrity, right? Which is essentially my fifth step principle. And integrity is about the sense of wholeness. It's about the sense of completion. You know, the, in the sense of the steps for me, it was about being able to see my entire self. I was able to tell my entire life story to one person that I was being in integrity with, with these, these understandings, these experiences of my life. But part of that for me is that I constantly make a decision that when I, when I give my word to something, I follow through to completion. Like I'm in integrity with my word. Um, and that for me is a huge, huge piece of the decisions that I make because the decision in step three without action really doesn't have much of a long lasting effect, right? Because all it's like that, I would always hear this in the rooms and they would say, you know, four, four frogs on a log. 
and one decides to jump off, how many frogs are still on the log, right? Because the decision without action is just really complacency. And what I learned in that was that my third step, if anything, it was that if I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Um, I don't make the excuse about why I don't. It's that if I say I'm going to be somebody in the world, I'm going to be that person. Um, and most importantly, that if I say I'm going to be somebody, I'm not saying it because my sobriety has nothing to do with proving people wrong. My sobriety has everything to do with showing other people what's possible, not because I don't drink, but about what actually gets to happen when you walk with God. And you don't need to be an alcoholic to see that or not. You know, I don't believe like if I were to spend my life trying to prove other people wrong, the entire motivation would be shame. It would be the entire motivation would be furthering the separation between me and that that person rather than showing them what's possible for themselves, rather than being a, a means of example. Right. Me trying to prove other people wrong. I don't carry humility in my heart with that. And in doing that, it's not me moving further from that person. It's me moving further from God. So there's a consistent decision for me that I make in the way that my third step decision continues to evolve for me is where am I willing to lean into my into an edge that feels uncomfortable? Where am I, where do I allow myself to consistently stay outside of my comfort zone so that I continue to grow as an individual, as a partner, as a daughter, as a friend, um, as somebody else in sobriety, as a sponsor, as a sponsee, as somebody that is responsible for a tremendous business today? Um, like, how do I allow myself to consistently stay on the edge of discomfort with God? Um, because my comfort and my growth are never going to be in the same room. Right. And if I want to continue to maintain this, I want to continue to experience this. I want to continue to grow in understanding and effectiveness. It's never going to happen from a place where I'm resting on my laurels. And when I think about resting on my laurels, it's not about that. What didn't work, you know, what I did yesterday won't work today. Of course it does. I've been doing the same thing for three and a half years. But what it, for me, what it means is that I cannot stay in a place where I'm consistently comfortable. If I'm not getting uncomfortable, if I'm not looking at myself more deeply, if I'm not identifying my patterns of behavior, if I'm not questioning why I do things, if I'm not questioning my reactions, if I'm not questioning where I'm not opening up to people or I'm not allowing people to get to see me or to know me or I'm in this position where I'm constantly looking to separate myself from people, then I find myself in a space where I feel as if God feels far. And um, there's this there's this thing, right? But if God feels far, it's not God who moves, right? So I have to consistently stay on this edge of discomfort because the thing for me is that edge is somewhere where there's never going to be a time that I actually walk without fear. Like I'm always going to be afraid. It is quite literally the human experience. Like it is just the human experience of growth. Like as long as you are committed to growth, you're going to be afraid because you're, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be unfamiliar. And your brain's number one job is survival. It's going to always push you back to your comfort zone. It's always going to bring you back to, to what's familiar. It's quite literally why I struggled so hard to get sober, right? It wasn't because it wasn't even that I was, it wasn't even because that I was resistant to sobriety. It was, I had no experience with it. My brain thought that, that like my body, my brain thought that alcoholism was safer than freedom, was safer than sobriety. So as I look at that in my life now, and I'm never going to have a day where I'm more sober than the day I was before. I'm either sober or I'm not sober to me today. But what I am is moving consistently in a trajectory that is outgrowing yesterday's version of me. And because I'm always going to be scared in that experience, right? It's like that for me is courage and my third step principles, faith, my fourth step principles, courage. And there was something I heard in the beginning of my uh, sobriety. And it said that courage is just fear with faith behind it. So if I know that I'm always going to be frightened, like I'm always going to be scared when I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone, I'm always going to be afraid when I want to take more radical responsibility, or I want to take ownership, or I need to make an amends in the moment. The more I am walking with faith, with that fear, with God, I don't just, I don't so much outgrow the fear as much as I start to lean in further to the courage. And courage for me is just the ability to do scary things and ability to do big things because God is with me in the process. So essentially my decision was that I don't want to play God because I don't want to do it alone. You know, I don't want to do life alone. But part of that is that I never feel lonely. I never feel like I'm alone. I never feel like I am without. I never feel like something's missing. I never feel like I'm unsafe. I never feel like there's something that's wronged me. I don't feel like there's anything that's that's a problem. I don't feel like there needs to be a struggle. I don't feel like there needs to be suffering. I don't feel like I wake up restless, irritable, and discontent. I go to bed at night, and one of my favorite prayers is just, God, come lay down and put your arm around me. And I wake up in the morning and I say, good morning, God, what do you need me to do today? Because I am here and I am ready to work for you. So you just tell me what you need me to go and do. And I go about my day. Um, 
you know, when I bring that greeting in, not just upon awakening or before I go to sleep at night, because the book tells me to do it because I actually have a desire to have a relationship with God. And I think that that's what, what shifted for me is that it's not that I'm obedient to a book. It's that the book actually gave me an experience where I want to continue to have that experience, you know? So there's an element for me around sobriety that even is just a, um, like my third step decision in some ways has made me into a very selfish person because why would I not want to experience something else every day that I wake up and choose to keep God with me? It really is because I feel damn good about it. You know, if it didn't feel great, I don't know that I would have the same experience, right? It's the same thing for me with service. You know, service changes the person who serves. You know, I'm not in control of the outcome. I'm I'm responsible for the effort, but I see what service does. I see how helping other people changes me, you know, I was listening to something else last night and this gentleman said, you know, he said, I wake up in the morning and the first thing that I do is pray and meditate, not for me, but so that I bring you clean energy. You know, he said, I wake up in the morning and I decide that I'm going to eat a certain way or I'm going to exercise in a certain way. So that way I'm in the best state of mental health possible. So that way, when you're interacting with me, I have emotional availability for you. He said, when I'm reading and I'm learning, he said, it's not just for me. It's so that I'm able to walk with you and talk with you in a way that's going to actually support you in a deeper way. He said, what we do for ourselves is the offering for others. And I think about that constantly in the way that I want to evolve as a human being. And like, what is God going to allow me to do is really only as far as I'm willing to take God with me in the process. So when I think about my third step decision, it's not just for me about, you know, continuing the steps and moving through the all 12. It's about like, how do I move in my daily life on a constant basis where I desire to have a relationship with God that not just makes me feel excellent, but also is something that's in contribution to people. That the way that I carry myself in the world, the way that I am that I am able to move with a certain embodiment is that if people come in contact with me and I'm the only example they get of AA, is that I hope that I'm a representation of those principles and actions. And more importantly for me is that it helps me decide who I am when nobody's looking And more importantly than that, it makes me, it helps me decide who I am inside of my mind that I just don't inventory my actions. I inventory my thoughts and the four letter words, because there can be nice things coming out of my mouth. But if inside of my mind is sending some sort of hmm, misintentioned energy to people, because I feel disrupted inside, it teaches me to go back and decide to look at myself rather than that person because all they are is mirroring back to me somewhere I get to bring God into relationship with me in a deeper way. Um, you know, I don't experience, there's a lot of things about sobriety that sometimes people tell me that they don't experience in the same way that I do. Um, you know, but I can also tell you that I committed myself to being miserable, you know, and that's what discontentment is for me. It's just a commitment to being miserable. Um, And I was so committed to that story for so long um, that I already have a lot of experience with that. And I'm really a lot more curious about what life gets to hold when I don't need things to be hard. Like, what if I just had this expert? If my life is based around expectations, then I genuinely just expect the best for me about the things that are within my power to control, which is essentially my behavior. Um, So there's a consistent decision for me where I decide that God's going to walk with me and everything and make anything that I put my thoughts, my feelings, my intentions, and my actions to is going to make something possible for me to get some sort of experience out of that. Um, You know, that third step decision has me look at my life as opportunity as opposed to obligation. Um, So if you're new, if you're coming in, if this is your first time in a meeting, if you're coming back, if you're struggling, please get numbers, please get a big book, please go through the preface, the forwards, the 164, the spiritual experience in the back. Please take one other person through the steps. I promise your life will change. I thank you guys for having me today. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.